Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today on this finally sunny day. I'm Sharon Ox, the Director of Health Services for the Department of Developmental Services. On behalf of Gail Grossman, Assistant Commissioner for Quality Management at DDS, I'm pleased to welcome you to the sixth webinar in our ongoing series of topics related to enhancing quality supports for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. These webinars are brought to you in partnership between the Center for Developmental Disabilities Evaluation and Research at the Shriver Center, UMass Medical School, and DDS. In particular, I'd like to thank Emily Lauer, Christine Clifford, and Courtney Noblet from CEDAR for their assistance with these webinars. We couldn't do it without them. Before we get started, I'd like to mention that we'll do a Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. You should see a Q&A box in the bottom right corner of your screen for typing in questions. Our presenters will answer questions at the end of the presentation. If you have a technical problem with today's webinar, please email CEDAR at c-d-d-e-r at umassmed.edu. I'd like to introduce today's speakers besides myself, Shannon McDonald, Chiomo Ogbo, and Paula Dunn Meadows are from WCI. These ladies have many years of experience in the DD field and manage residential, day, and clinical services at WCI. They have had many opportunities to coordinate care and interact with ED personnel in emergency situations. So on to today's agenda. We're going to be talking about the, some DDS emergency room visit data, um, the ER provider survey results that we conducted back in 2013, some steps for a successful ER visit. We're going to discuss advocacy, in particular advocacy in the ER. We're going to uh, certainly, uh, WCI will be presenting a case study, and then we'll have questions. Let's take a look at the emergency room data that we've collected from DDF. Um, this was recently uh, gathered to help us understand the extent of ER use in this population. I would like to say, though, that this data was collected from individuals living in residential supports only. It does not include those living at home with family or those living independently. As you can see, we compare pretty favorably with the general population until we reach the age group between 45 and 64. We can theorize that this reflects the fact that the people we support can have much more complicated health histories at an earlier age than the general population. And then you see the big jump between the ages of 45 to 64 and then 65 plus. Our individuals certainly visit the ER is at a much higher rate than the general population. Again, we're supposing that that has to do with the sort of complicated health histories of the individuals we support. All right. Now we took a look at the uh, ER visits and the top five diagnoses that resulted in the ER visit. The most common physical injury by far, since that's the most common reason for people to visit the ER, um, are, is due to a fall. And that comes as no surprise to most of you as we've discussed this in previous webinars. The second most common diagnosis is seizures. And one of the reasons that this number is, is fairly high is because that's often part of the seizure protocol, that if a seizure continues for a certain length of time, that the follow-up is always um, an ER visit to evaluate the individual, or if there's been a suspected injury as a result of the seizure. Respiratory infections are the third leading reason, uh, diagnosis for a visit to the ER. Um, and that's not a surprise either, as we have a very high rate of aspirations in this population. Urinary tract infections, again, are the fourth. Um, and then G and J tube related um, issues. And again, this may be due to protocols that may be in place for individuals when there are issues with your G or J tube the healthcare provider may have actually indicated on their protocol that they should visit the ER for things such as blockages or displacements or any complications with their G or J tube. So back in 2013, DDS surveyed providers in the summer, and the following were reported as the top components of a successful ER visit. Um, so number one was bringing accurate and up-to-date healthcare information 
history, 86% of the providers reported that as the top reason, the top important factor for a successful ER visit. Number two is having familiar staff accompany the person, familiar staff to the individual, that is. And then three, having staff willing and able to speak up for the person. In other words, advocate for the individual in the ER. I don't think any of you are surprised by these results. I think the trick may be in actually providing these supports when the time comes for someone to go to the ER. Is that familiar staff person actually working and available to go to that, with that person to the ER? Um, how do you determine what is the important and accurate information to accompany the person to the ER? And um, how do you make sure that your staff are comfortable in the ER and able to speak up for the individual? So I'm not going to turn this over to Shannon McDonald from WCI to tell you how they are able to support the, their individuals and their staff in the ED setting. Shannon? Hi. Thank you for the wonderful introduction and good morning, everyone. Um, as we get started, just a little bit about WCI, which stands for Work Community Independence. Uh, we're an agency in Waltham. We're a private nonprofit. We provide 24-hour and less than 24-hour supports um, to homes and apartments for over 135 people, as well as employment and day supports for 75 individuals. And we have a clinical team that consists of myself, the clinical director, and two assistant clinical directors, in addition to three registered nurses, two full-time, uh, full one part-time. And our goal at WCI is to foster the greatest possible degree of independence and competence for individuals with intellectual disabilities and to encourage individuals to live, work, and be part of the community and achieve an optimal lifestyle. So that's a little about us. So here's our data for um, January to June 2014 for the top reasons for ER visits, just to have to compare to the overall data that you just saw. So our largest by far were the um, falls, which syncs up pretty well with what she had, uh, Sharon had just mentioned. And motor vehicle accidents, I think that's probably high because more than one person is involved de facto. Um, illness at a day program. And then we have frostbite. That was one person who uh, went four times for frostbite. So I think it's a little higher than it might look, um, or it looks higher than it actually is. And significant behavior incidents, which is what SBI stands for. And this is 28 visits altogether that this is representing. And then for all of our unexpected hospital visits, because those were just the top five categories, we had illness and injury tying for the two top positions, and then significant behavior incidents were only 18%. And that's out of 51 total for that six-month period. So now we're going to talk a little bit about the emergency room. So before you're even going, you need to decide if someone needs to go to the emergency room. And for all of this, we're talking about um, largely our policy is what we do at WCI. Your policy is that your agency may differ, so always follow what your agency policy is. Um, but when you're deciding if someone might need to go, you want to consider if there's any written or signed protocols for someone's medical condition. For example, if they have a seizure disorder and there's a protocol that says if they have a seizure that lasts longer than five minutes, take them to the ER. You take them to the ER. That's easy. You don't have to make a decision at all. Um, the magnitude of the problem, and we'll talk about this a little bit later in a few slides, but you know, if they're bleeding profusely, if they're obviously extremely ill, you're not going to him and haw about whether they need to go. You're just going to call 911, basically. Um, and then you want emergency support for direct staff. So as direct staff, you shouldn't be by yourself making this decision. You should have assistance from your administration or um, whoever at your agency is on call. We have what's called the administrator on duty. Um, we also have clinical on call 24-7. Um, most agencies have at least an administrator that's on call and available. And they should be able to assist you in deciding if someone should go or not. So that's not all on you. Um, and again, agencies might differ when staff are expected to call 911. Um, this is the easiest one. <laughs> you always want to follow your doctor's instructions. Um, if he says to go to urgent care, go there. If he says to go to the ER, go to the ER. Um, also, you might have um, a clinical team on call for psychiatric assistance, but we're not going to cover psychiatric hospital visits in this presentation. Um, and then when in doubt, always err on the side of caution. You're never going to get in trouble or you know, deeply regret having gone and they turn out to be fine, whereas if you decide not to go or you take too long deciding and it was something that was very serious and the person you know, has kind of dire consequences from it, 
that would be a very bad situation. So if you're in your gut and you're saying this is really serious, just go to the ER. Um, but the best thing you can do is call the doctor and do whatever they say if you can get a hold of them. So these are our guidelines. For life-threatening emergencies, again, bleeding profusely, chest pain, if they're unconscious or non-responsive. And what non-responsive means is that they can't make eye contact with you. They're not answering to their name. They cannot respond to you for a period of time. Um, you're just calling 911 and you're going to the ER. That's not much of a decision right there. For falls at WCI, we always go to the ER or urgent care, depending on the severity of the fall. Um, but your agency might have a different protocol. Um, and again, they're on the side of caution. So if someone falls in the snow and they land like kind of in a bank of snow and they say they feel fine, that would be urgent care. If they fall and slip on ice and they hit their head really hard, it might be the ER that you want to go to. Changes in any significant medical condition that they might have. Um, if someone had bronchitis and they got sent home with antibiotics or something like that, and they're getting worse, not better, you would want to take them to the urgent care or emergency room, depending on what the doctor says, because hopefully you can get a hold of them first for guidance. Um, any signs of common Ill illnesses that do not improve for more than 24 hours? So say someone is uh, coughing, and you take them to the doctor, and the doctor gives them medicine and says, you know, this should clear up, and they're coughing more or they were vomiting and you called the doctor yesterday and they said, oh, they only threw up twice, it should be fine, but now they're throwing up like every hour, that would be a time when you want to call the doctor for more guidance or go to the urgent care or ER, depending. Um, medication refusal more than three times, you at the very least want to contact the doctor or get um, guidance from the doctor when the medication is prescribed of when it would be good to go to the hospital if they refuse medication and when not, because some medications, uh, the withdrawal side effects can be severe and you know some are not as urgent. So getting guidance from your physician or from the prescribing provider might be the best way to go with that. Um, at WCI, we try to always contact the doctor or go to urgent care if there's more than three refusals, but that's our policy. And then this one is pretty important. Then any new or unusual symptoms, even if they're not medical emergencies, but if they're very unusual for the person, so someone who's never in their entire life told anybody they had a headache and suddenly they have the worst headache ever or they um, have never reported pain because they have you know, a huge pain threshold or something like that and they say that their hip's really, really hurting so bad they can't put weight on it. That's very unusual so you would definitely want to contact the doctor again, go to urgent care or ER depending on the severity of it and what the doctor guides you to do. And anything non-life-threatening, like the things I just talked about, you're going to call the healthcare provider if possible. So now we've figured out if we're going and where we're going. So we have to decide who's going to go with the person. Ideally, this is the number one situation you want, is that a MAP-certified staff who's familiar with the person is available to go. Um, because then they can check the orders, they you know, know what needs to be signed, things like that, and they also know the individual. Um, if you don't have anyone MAP certified that's working at the time, a staff who the person's very comfortable with and who's known them for a long time because they can help with advocacy, they can help describe past medical conditions, they'll have important information um, that someone who doesn't know the individual may not have and they'll be able to make the individual more comfortable. And then if 911 is called, usually they won't let you ride in the ambulance with the individual, so staff should follow the ambulance to the hospital and meet the person there. Um, and you want to make sure there's adequate staffing at home. So as direct care staff, this probably isn't your job. This is more the job of the administration that's on call that you're working with. Um, you have to make sure that whoever's left at home, those individuals are still in ratio. And if uh, we have one third of our individuals that we support are deaf, so we work a lot with interpreters and video relay. Um, but interpreting services counts just as much for anyone who's uh, got English as a second language. So if their first language is Spanish or Haitian or anything like that, you want the administrator who's working with you because you're the direct care and you're you know, working with this individual who's very sick and the ambulance, you're not probably going to have time to call ahead to the ER. So hopefully they call ahead and say that the individual will need interpreting services. Most hospitals have ASL interpreters on staff or video relay interpreting. Um, so just make sure they call ahead so that they know and they're ready to help you. And now that you know where you're going and you're getting there, I'm going to hand this over to Paula Dunn-Meadows, and she's going to help you figure out what you need to bring with you.
Hi, and welcome. So as Shannon said, now that you know you're going to the ER and you know how you're going to get there, what do you need to bring with you? At WCI, we've developed a medical record as part of every individual's records. Um, and it contains everything that you will need to bring with you. Your agency may have a little bit different setup, so make sure you familiarize yourself with it. Before we go any further, I also want to just make sure that you remember that whatever you bring with you, you need to bring home. You do not leave any medical record at the ER or with the EMTs. One of the things that uh, you will need to remember is if you do send a person by ambulance, you need to send that medical information with them. It contains critical information that they may need en route or in their communications with the emergency room. So in WCI's medical record, it contains things like a copy of the healthcare record. This is the tool that we use at Individuals ISP. It has a nice snapshot of their history. It has a nice snapshot of their uh, medication. It has all of their contact information as well. It contains the emergency fact sheet and the ID form. It contains a current medication list. Um, please note that on each of these we're saying current. It's really important as part of any medical record that all of the information in there is kept current and up to date. Whenever there's a medication change, please make sure that you keep that medication list updated. That's going to be critical when you get to the emergency room. In our uh, med uh, medical record, we also have copies of the health care encounter forms, as this is part of the DDS regulation and will need to be filled out as part of your discharge from the emergency room. We also have copies of the doc orders that will need to be completed. In the back flap of our medical record, we also have an incident report. Um, sometimes at the emergency room, part of your job is just to sit. It's just as you sit to start filling out all of the paperwork that you know is going to have to be done anyway. Also, as soon as you open the medical record, we have copies of everybody's insurance cards or hospital cards. This is going to be something that you need on hand as you walk the, in through the door. Um, again, I want to make sure that you remember that anything you bring with you must be brought home again. So here we have a copy of our, our current medication list. Um, this is also going to be filled out for anything that you do um, when you're at the emergency room if there are any medication changes. Note that it has the five rights and it is MAP compliant. Uh, part of your job of advocating is to make sure that you uh, bring these regulations to the emergency room staff. Remember, that's your job. That's not theirs. The biggest part of your job at the emergency room is advocating for the individual. And what does advocacy mean? It means that you're speaking up to support another person. You're there to help protect their rights. You're help, there to help improve the services for that person. And you're there to help remove any barriers that they may have. Many of the individuals that we support may have difficulty reporting pain. They may have difficulty with the language that they use. As the person who knows them well, Part of your job is to help them speak up clearly and to make sure ad, uh, accurate information is shared. You need to also remember that advocacy should always be done in a professional manner. Uh, it's how you show respect for the person that you're supporting and to the health care provider. Another key part of advocacy is making sure that you ask for help when you need it, um, making sure that information is clear and that you get any advice and assistance that is needed. So as we know, when you go to the emergency room, it's often, often not the best of times. Either the person has fallen and hurt themselves, or they're feeling very ill. One of the things that you is your job is to help them remain calm and assist the person as much as possible. Remember, you're there to speak with the person, not for the person. Don't talk to the hospital staff like that person is not there. You need to help the person accurately report their symptoms and their pain. Sometimes this need means that you need to prompt them with questions. Sometimes it means that you need to provide the additional information if it's needed. 
One of the things that is also your job is to remain with the person for tests and blood work. All right, now, they may not let you go in the room for all of the tests, but it's a comfort for that individual if you're walking the hallway with them or if you're walking beside the gurney as they're going down the hallway. This is pretty critical and, and a, again, a way to keep the person calm as much as possible. One of the other things that you'll be doing is as you get instructions, whether it be from the nurse or the health care provider, um, is reviewing that with the individual. Remember, you know them best. Use the words and the terms that they can understand. Again, it will help the anxiety as much as possible. For At WCI, we do advocacy training. We do how to attend appointments with people, and part of that is how to attend ER appointments. Um, the other thing to remember is you do have support. You're not out there alone. You need to remember that you need to keep your administrator on duty or whoever your on-call person is for your agency informed. They can also help you as, as the person goes through the process. So what are some of the things that you absolutely must do? All right. You need to report all symptoms and relevant history to the hospital staff, even it appear, if it appears minor. As part of doing this, you need to identify yourself and your role in the person's life. All right. Remember that HIPAA is critical when you go to the ER. The hospital staff is not supposed to or going to just give information to anybody. When you check in in triage, you need to make sure that you're identifying the individual, you're identifying them by their full name, you're identifying yourself, and your role in that person's life. Again, this gives you the way in to be part of this process. You also need to let the person know if the hospital staff know if the person has a guardian. You need to make sure that this information is with you. Again, for WCI, it's part of our medical record. It will have the person's name. It will have their contact information. Remember, you are not the guardian. You may not sign for the individual. You may not give permission for tests. That is a guardian's role. While you're at the ER and in triage, contact nursing on call or your administrator on duty and give them an update as frequently as you can. It's also, they're also there if you need any assistance or if you feel the person is either not being heard or not treated appropriately. Again, you've already told them who you are and where you work. This will help the connection with your administrator on duty and the hospital as well. The, hosp uh, the on call administrator can also help if you're struggling a little bit with keeping um, the person calm and tolerating tests. So, again, don't be able, don't be afraid to use that resource. That's what we're there for. So let's again go over the emergency room must-dos. When you get there, you need to give the person's full name. You also need to give your full name, what your role is, and the agency that you work with. It's very helpful if you explain that the person lives in a DDS community supported home. Again, it gives you a reason for being there. It gives you a reason for being heard and to help advocate. You may again have to explain guardianship and make sure that that, confirmation, that contact information is readily available. Again, you are not the guardian. You may not make decisions. You should never leave the hospital unless that person is admitted fully to their room they're discharged, or you're relieved by another staff. The other thing that you really need to keep in mind is that if a person is admitted, the hospital may be saying that staff need to stay with them. Again, you know this individual. You know if this is part of their criteria. You need to call your AOD, your administrator on duty at your agency, and that person will discuss with DDS the need for any further service in that area. Again, we want to make sure that you remember, do not leave any documentation there. That medical record has to come home with you. Okay? Again, whatever you take, take back with you. So now, oh, now let's take a little pop quiz. Advocacy true or false? 
Should guardians be contacted to approve treatment? Absolutely they should, that's true. You are never allowed to make judgment for the individual. Can you sign for the person? Absolutely not. Again, you are not the guardian. You are not um, the individual. That is not your job. So now I am going to turn this over to Chioma, who is going to talk further about emergency room discharge. Thank you, Paula. So <clears throat> we have um, identified when to go to the ER. We've identified who goes to the ER. We've helped the individual to advocate for during the time that they, they are at the ER and it's time for discharge. There are questions that, you know, as the direct staff that you have to be asking, once they tell you that it's time for discharge, you first, you, you must want to um, notify your administrator on call or whoever is on call um, to let them know that it's time for discharge. Just keep them updated on, you know, what has happened and it's time for discharge. So um, in terms of medications and discharge summaries, um, you want to be asking, you know, what, are there any new medications? Um, you want to check if the orders are MAP compliant. That's very, very, very critical. Um, otherwise, you may have to be coming back. Um, you want to be asking questions about um, the entire summary uh, as you review the summary, discharge summary. If discharge, if they are, if the individual is discharged after hours, you want to request that the hospital provide enough doses for medication to cover until the pharmacy opens or, you know, have the prescription prescription called into a 24-hour pharmacy. Um, that's extremely critical to make sure that the individual, the person served has the right medication when they get home. So now when you're reviewing this discharge summary, you want to make sure that the, the medications are or all the forms are signed and complete. You want to ensure that the pages where there are medications, each if it's more than one page that is signed by the authorized prescriber who is either the doctor or the nurse practitioner but not the nurses. You want to ensure that the ER discharge, again, health, that the ER discharge um, summary is signed on every page if possible, no electronic signatures. In terms of, you know, follow-up, you want to be reviewing to make sure that follow-up instructions are specific. If there are, you know, specific specialists that are required, you want to make sure that the hospital recommends one, um, or if the person does not already a healthcare provider in that specialty. In terms of and again, review with your AOD to make sure that all the documentations are signed and that you have and that you need. And then when you're going home, bring discharge paperwork. And don't forget the medical book that you may have given to the emergency, the ambulance EMTs. Um, to request that back. So bring all the paperwork, the doctor's orders, make sure that all the medical documents are brought with you, inform appropriate personnel and documentation notification upon return. Some of the critical things that you want to keep in mind again is that you have all this, all the signed documentations eligible that the, the new medication orders um, have been reviewed by the AOD. If there are any changes that they are signed by the authorized prescriber, who is again the uh, doctor or the nurse practitioner, not nurses. Um, if there are any time frames for when the, in, the person has to come back uh, for follow-ups, you want to make sure that the, um, that the referral is specific, the time frame is specific. Um, if there are any special, special specialties, specialized Doctor is needed that, that you have a name and a phone number to contact to make the follow-up appointments. You want to find out if the person should um, return to day program if possible. Um, 
and so that they, you can notify the AOD to to let the day programs know that the person was at the ER. And then the following forms are, you know, WCI forms. All agencies have some form that the healthcare provider that they use for healthcare provider orders. Um, what's important about these forms is they, uh, that they are that they have the five rights, which is uh, DDS regulation. Um, as you can see, uh, the form has the person's information, allergies, the pharmacy that they are going. This form helps you detail to detail to um, make sure that you all the things that you have or that you need to be able to administer medications when you get home are MAP compliant. Um, the reason for the visits, just in case if you have no idea what they were diagnosed for. Um, list of current medications, you want to be reconciling the, if there are new orders with what you have at home, if you have any questions that you're clarifying. Any, for, any findings or diagnosis, any tests or treatments that were ordered extremely important that you know what's going on and that you keep in tune what's happening with the person served. Um, again, you want to make sure that all pages are signed by the doctor. Um, any any follow-ups that are needed or if medications need vital signs, extremely crucial that you're clarifying these orders and that you're understanding the orders also. And then for this form on the bottom, you can see that it helps the direct staff to uh, follow up with anything that's needed, you know, whether the orders are transcribed, that you're keeping, that the communication is flowing, that you've picked up pharmacy or that they've called in medications, that the guardians are notified, um, that all, you have all the documentations, whether the person has x-rays or labs. While you keep in communication with your AOD, your AOD will help you not to notify the chain of command um, with internal parties, um, such as the clinical team, the guardian, um, all direct support staff that are part of the team for the person served. And also, you want to make sure you know what, that the Texas incident report is completed and forwarded to supervisor to complete. Check with your agency for your procedures for chain of command. In terms of notifying external parties for follow-ups and plans, it's important that, again, um, whoever is on call is helping you to notify the service coordinator um, and day program or employment are notified, even when there are no changes with the person, um, that the PCP are notified. A lot of times they don't know that the person has gone to the ER. So this kind of promotes communication. The PCP has to be notified and also a follow-up appointment has to be scheduled. And if there are any special special specialists that you schedule that appointment as a follow-up. Also, don't forget, extremely crucial, you know when you're at, you're at the ER, it's really hard to get uh, signals. So text messages may be more effective than phone calls in the hospital. Um, so, you know, uh, WCI has approved that, but you want to check with your agency to make sure that that has been approved as well. <laughs> so for agency review for ER visits, um, at we review in clinical operations team, um, and some of the things we review with every ER visit it are updating the entire clinical team, recommendations for follow-up if there are any, and prevention strategies to prevent any follow further ER visits for the people served. And now I will turn it back to Shannon. Hello again. All right, so we're just going to do a review of what we've learned so far. Um, first, we've gone over how to decide if someone needs to go to the emergency room or to visit urgent care. Again, if it's life-threatening, you just take them. You call 911. Um, the second option, the best one, is always to do whatever the doctor says if you can get a hold of the health care provider. 
um, who should go with the individual. Again, someone who knows MAP and is familiar with them is your best scenario. Um, if that's not available, the most important thing is someone who knows the individual really well. Um, what you need to bring with you, as Paula mentioned, you need to bring the medical record or whatever version of that your agency has for the part of a confidential file that contains the individual's medical records. Um, at bare minimum, you would at least want the emergency fact sheet that has the individual's name, date of birth, medications, allergies, diagnoses, things like that. Um, you want the HCP order form so you can get MAP compliant med orders right at the ER so you don't have to go back and try to get them again. Um, insurance cards, hospital ID cards if they have one, things like that. Um, and to take it all back with you, everything you brought. Um, necessary documentation to bring and complete the visit. Um, again, that's the healthcare provider order and also if you can, having a written incident report that you can complete while you're there and it's fresh in your mind might be a good idea. It's what we do at WCI. We've learned how to help the individuals advocate for themselves, which includes talking to them, not talking about them while they're in the room as if they're not there. Uh, making sure that they're treated in a timely fashion, not getting kind of ignored and pushed aside in the ER. In the ER. So, you know, just asking the front desk what's going on or having your administrator help you do that kind of thing. But you want to make sure they have as thorough care as everybody else would have and as timely. Um, and then, again, communication is essential to a successful visit, be it text messages, calls, whatever you need to do. But the more you communicate, the more smoothly everything's going to go. And always, health and safety come first. So we're going to do a quick case study. And we'll talk about Bob. He is a lovely gentleman who's 70 years old, and he lives with us in 24-hour supports. He used to live in an apartment with his significant other, um, but he had health issues that you know, got worse as he got older, so it caused a need for increased supports. Um, so as you can tell, since he lived alone, he communicates very well. He is presumed competent, so he doesn't need a guardian. Um, he uses a walker for balance, and he has a very complex medical history. He has a seizure disorder. He has an acquired brain injury. He's had multiple surgeries in all different places. He has a history of falls, and he's on multiple medications. So Bob is fairly complex. So what happened was Bob woke up at night, and he was trying to reach for his bottle of water on his nightstand, and he fell out of bed. So staff realized he fell out of bed. Since Bob has a history of falls, we have a protocol already to just call 911 if Bob ever falls out of bed. So they didn't have to decide if he has to go or not which is always nice for direct care. Um, once the emergency medical team got there, um, they provided them and the ambulance with the medical record, and they followed the ambulance to the hospital in their own car. As soon as they got to the hospital, they let the AOD or whoever the administrator on call was know that they got there upon arrival. And while they were waiting to be seen by triage, they started writing their incident report, and everything was fresh in their mind. And then once in triage, Bob gave his medical history because, again, he's a good self-advocate. Um, but he's not always the best reporter. He kind of rushes through things. So staff noticed he left out some crucial information and asked him questions to help him give an accurate um, medical history and idea of what had happened to him. And then while in the exam room, after triage, you know, they were waiting there with the nurse. And uh, staff, with the nurse's help, helped explain to Bob what was going to happen next. So. After this, you might get a blood test, and where's the blood test, and how long will that take, those kinds of things, to help reduce his anxiety about the whole ordeal. So after that, staff went with Bob to his x-rays and blood work. They could not go in the room for the x-ray, of course, because, you know, cancer. Um, but they were able to be with him for the blood work and help him through that. And staff were texting the administrator at WCI every single time something happened. So after the blood work, they sent a test, done with blood work, waiting for the x-ray. So the AOD knew what, was, knew what was going on the whole time. So then Bob was ready for discharge. They gave him a, a prescription for Tylenol for pain. He found, was found to be perfectly fine every other way. And so they called the AOD because they were getting ready for discharge and read what the med order was. And it was twice daily as needed for pain, which obviously is not MAP compliant. So with the help of the AOD, they changed the prescription for Tylenol to be MAP compliant. And since this was in the middle of the night, staff requested a dose of Tylenol before leaving so that Bob would not have to suffer any discomfort before stores opened in the morning. 
Um, and staff also clarified follow-up instructions with the physician. Um, you know, would he be able to go to work? Does he need to see his primary care physicians? Should he see his orthopedic surgeon? All those kinds of things so that they knew exactly what they should be doing. And don't be afraid to ask questions. Sometimes doctors, well, almost always doctors are in a rush and nurses are in a rush. So if they rush through something, you don't understand quite what they said, make sure you ask as many questions as you need to until you're very clear on what is supposed to be going on. Um, so after all of that, staff and everybody else, including Bob, arrived safely home with the Tylenol, with a MAP-compliant med order and a MAP-compliant prescription. Um, they notified the AOD they got home. They notified the guardian and everybody else who knew about the hospital visit. Um, and I can say from my personal experience, I know Paula's experiences too, when we're on call, we know someone's going to the hospital and then someone gets discharged and there's nothing wrong with them. Like with Bob, they found no you know, real issues, so they don't remember to call and notify everybody, so then we're sitting there worried at 2 in the morning because we don't know what happened. <laughs> so please remember, everybody who knew that the hospital visit was taking place, make sure to follow up and call them back as soon as you get home so that we can all rest and know what happened, or we can take follow-up actions you know, as needed and appropriate. So, um, I think we're ready for any questions if you guys have some. Let's see. Oh, we have a question here. All right, it says, discharge instruction sheets. Are staff allowed to sign for the instructions given? Let Chioma, our map. Right. So, um, for discharge instruction sheets, um, obviously, I hope that it is the authorized prescriber, whether it's a doctor or the nurse practitioner that are signing it. However, when you do get home, you must post and verify those orders. And at that point, you will be signing. The, the direct staff will be signing, be posting it and verifying with your signatures. And I hope that answered that question. All right. I think they might be referring to whether or not they can, is there a place to sign on those that they have reviewed them and received them and understand them? I think that might be the question. Is it okay for direct care staff to sign that section of it? Okay, so there's a, there's a couple of, just to clarify exactly what we're talking about. We're talking about when you are ready to leave you the emergency room and the nurse more than likely is sitting there and going over all of the instructions with you. So for example, it might be um, you've been diagnosed with bronchitis, I think was an example. Um, you've been given a prescription for an inhaler, perhaps, and it's a MAP-compliant prescription. You need to follow up with your doctor in 7 to 10 days. Those are the instructions that we're talking about. Typically, staff are allowed to sign for those because those are just the follow-up instructions. You are not allowed to sign for treatments in the hospital. These are just the instructions that you're to follow once you go home. It's always good if you're reviewing them with the individual at the same time, because by then the person's just usually pretty grateful that the whole ordeal is over. They're also paying attention, and they're going to start reminding you in the morning exactly what's supposed to be happening next. Okay, our next question, which I guess I'll take since I'm clinical. Um, what if someone needs behavioral supports in the emergency room? Uh, hopefully you have clinical on-call at your agency. You may not. Um, a lot of them don't. So generally speaking, uh, the more the person can know about what's happening, what's going to happen next, like the less unknowns there are, especially if they're not used to the hospital, um, the more relaxed they're going to be. If they can be with someone familiar, that's extremely helpful. But speaking generally, if someone um, has behavioral issues that are fairly intense, they'll probably have a behavior plan. So what you should do at home versus in the ER in response to challenging behaviors doesn't really change. You should, you should still follow their behavior plan. And for individuals who are kind of frequent flyers at the ER because they like hospital visits, um, most of the behavior plans will say how to address that. So. And if I went to all of the behavioral and psych visit stuff, it'd be a whole another webinar. But in short, that's generally some things you can do. All right, the next question. 
What can I do to help someone wait in the emergency room? That's the one thing you can be certain of in the emergency room is that you are going to wait. And you are probably going to wait a fair amount of time. Again, one of the benefits of knowing, sending the most familiar staff is that you know the individual. You are probably going to know some of the information that is most helpful. So for example, is it going to be helpful if this person gets a blow by blow of what you're going to do? So for example, if Shannon and I, are, and, uh, and I are at the emergency room and I know Shannon is struggling with her waiting and I know that time is important, I'm going to tell her, Shannon, we got here 10 minutes ago. In 10 minutes, we're going to go recheck in at the desk. After we recheck in at the desk, then we're going to go sit in our seat again and we're going to then go into triage. So I'm going to help her on a step-by-step -step basis to wait. Sometimes it's helpful, remember you have a medical record there, practicing with them at that point in time. So when it's our turn, Shannon, to go in and see the nurse in triage, what are some of the things we want to make sure that she knows? Again, it helps pass the time, it keeps the person preoccupied, keeps them engaged in the process at the same time. Okay, next one is uh, what, if there, or what if there are no staff who are familiar with the individual, basically? Um, so obviously, if they need to go to the ER, they need to go to the ER. You're still sending them. Um, what I would do would be um, to see if you can at least get a staff on the phone who's familiar with the individual so you can get like a good background and good history. Because you may not know that every February they get bronchitis like on the clock, and this is not unusual for them, which is important information for triage and the doctor. Um, or you may not know that they've never had it before, whereas if you could at least talk to somebody who knows the individual well, they would be able to give you that kind of information. And sometimes if the individual talks on the phone with someone they know very well, it calms them down also. So basically that's what I would do if there's no one available. I would try to get them by phone at least. Okay, so our next question is, for people who need assistance with ADLs, such as toileting, is it staff's sole responsibility or the hospital? This is never a popular question, and I'm sure it's not going to be a popular answer. However, it has always been my, my experience while at the emergency room is that you are probably better off if staff do the assisting. For a great deal of it, um, it's more helpful for the individual to have someone who knows how to help them, what their routine is. It, it's, there's a comfort factor there as well as a, a management factor there. There are going to be some tests that the hospital will not let you go in and help them with because it might um, uh, damage protocol of, of the test in and of itself. But in general, work that out with the nurse. Um, who's helping you also work that out with the individual you know what would be most comfortable for you how does that work best and again make sure that you're checking in with that health care provider to know the parameters of exactly what that person is supposed to be doing so for example the difference between does a person have to use the restroom or do they need to take a urine sample so make sure you're really clear all of that and again there is no such thing as asking too many questions and there's no such thing as uh, asking too many clarifiers. All right. This is a good, tricky question. Any tips for dealing with ER staff who disregard the client based on disabilities? Um, I know I've run into this. And I've been a very, very squeaky wheel, basically, um, was the most I've done. Because what I've gotten is they try to just push them through really quickly without giving proper tests. Or they leave you to wait forever because the individual can't necessarily speak up and say, why haven't I been seen yet? Um, so as staff, you need to do all that advocacy. Um, if they're outwardly disregarding the client or the individual in front of you, um, I've been direct and said, you know, could you please speak to Jane because she's in the room. This is about her. It's not about me. So you need to ask her. And whenever they try to talk to you as if the individual isn't there, try to redirect them to speak to the individual. Um, those are my best tips. The squeaky wheel, honestly, I think is the best tip. You have something? A, a follow-up to that would also be is if you feel that you're not able to get the message across clearly, go back to your administrator on call because there's also somebody on call at that hospital who they can speak to. 
I think in general, hospitals do not want to have that kind of reputation with the constituency that they serve. Um, but sometimes people get overworked, we know that, um, and bad things happen. So you have a number of recourses there. You do your part, let your administrator do their part as well. I, I would also I would also say to that is that we, you know, we've done surveys with, um, with nurse practitioners and nurses in the past about their comfort level in serving this population. And a lot of them reveal that they're just very uncomfortable. They have no experience and they're uncomfortable. And I think sometimes simply saying to someone, you know, I sense that you're not comfortable, even if it's not in front of that individual but stepping out, you, you seem out of your element here. You know, is there something I can do to help you be more comfortable interviewing this individual? And sometimes it just sort of removes that barrier when you are sort of acknowledge that obviously they don't kind of know how to approach an individual. And I you always sort of start there with that. You know, I've, I've been there too. I remember the first individual I served with a, with a disability. You didn't even know how to approach them. I, I'm, I'm here to help you do that. What can I do to help you do that? It works and sometimes it doesn't. You know, this person's just resistant no matter what. But oftentimes it's just like, yeah, I, I, you know, tell me how I should be going in there and approaching this individual. That would be a big help to me. Just, just say, you seem comfortable. What can I do to make you more comfortable with so-and-so in there? And, and I agree with everything else you said. If you get there, you know, sometimes you need to fire up and, 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 and talk a little about how you're going to work out to have their staff a little bit more um, open to serving our folks. Um, we did get question here about should we give PRN anxiety meds prior to the visit? The, the answer to that is it depends. You know, um, you heard Shannon talk about, you know, there are some times where, where you're calling the physician, you know, prior to going to the ED. If this is someone that you know is going to have a real problem and you have already have an order for something like that for healthcare provider visits, ask. You know, you say, gee, we have an order every time they go for a visit or for lab work, you know, should we give, be giving this, you know, a, a Valium, whatever. So. It kind of depends. You might not want to be masking something, a symptom of something, by giving them an anti-anxiety med prior to going. Um, but if you're looking at a behavioral issue or something like that, you might. So you, sh you should ask. When in doubt, it probably, depending on what the med is, um, if it's Valium, it's probably a non-issue. But um, if, it's a, if it's a unique med, you might want to consider having a protocol in place where you bring a dose of that medication with you in case the ER may not have it. You can say, listen, when he gets worked up like this waiting, or whatever, you can certainly ask the ER, do you want to give them a dose of anti-anxiety med? If it's Valium, you could certainly, you know, simply tell, or Ativan or something, tell them, he has a routine order for something like this that really helps him. They can give it to him right then and there, you know. Um, so the answer is it depends. Um, there's another question here. Should we use our agency-specific health care provider order forms in the ER or use a DPH and counter form? Um, Discharge summary cannot be used as a health care provider order, right? Well, you can use, you know, the health care provider order forms, um, your agency-specific form. The DPH encounter form, if what you're referring to is what is in the um, policy manual, you know, you can use that too. You can use either or, all right? And actually, the discharge summary from the ER may or may not be okay. They're not always very complete. They often don't meet our requirements, you know, under MAP policy. And, and that's more about medication orders. That's less about if there are instructions, you know, for the doctor. That's more about if there's some kind of a medication order that they tend to not be very complete. They don't usually meet the needs. That tends to be why we want to have sort of this pre-made order form that forces them to fill in the blanks. You know, like you've seen with the uh, WCI forms where it has the five rights and it sort of guides them to fill out everything properly. So either one of those forms, I would recommend that you have something that's going to guide them. Otherwise, there's going to be something missing. It's going to be the, the route that's missing or the reason or something that's going to make you either go back or have to call the primary care to get it clarified the next day. Um, so I hope that answers that question for you. So we have another question that asks um, if uh, electronic signatures are permitted for MD orders but not for discharge summaries. Well, I just want to clarify that in terms of electronic signatures, there are some confusions with, you know, when it's printed on the bottom of the discharge summaries, for example. Those 
are not um, an acceptable signature. Um, the ex electronic accept the electronic signatures that are acceptable would be cursive. It has it has to be um, either stamped on, but it has to be in cursive for it to be a legal signature, not printed on the bottom of the summaries. And if you have cursive signatures, whether discharge summaries or MD orders, those are permitted legally. They have to be an actual facsimile of the physician's signature, which is correct as of this time. I know it's difficult <laughs> at times, but anyone could be typing at the bottom. Yes, you know, you know, this was by Doctor So and So. All right. Um, so, but we've been working with DPH on that. But as of now, you know, electronically signed, typed, you know, in font, electronically signed by So and So is not an acceptable signature for any healthcare provider order. So we just want to open the phone line real quick and see if there's any questions on the phone. So we're, we're going to do that right now. Conference is in talk mode. So folks on the phone, does anybody have a question they want to ask? Oops. Conference is in silent right. mode. One thing I wanted to I wanted to mention, this is Sharon, um, I, I really liked that WCI allows your staff to text because I can see that as a real good way to sort of have real time stamps when you're trying to do your HICSIS report later. You know, you, it's a way to sort of keep the details um, written down. You can go back and look at your text and really have a real sense about it. Um, that, that explains to me why when I read your incident reports, they're so detailed, <laughs> you know, about, you know, when this happened, when that happened, and, you know, every little detail of it. Um, so, and, you know, and frankly, that's, that's pretty helpful. So uh, I can see why that, will, that can help you down the road. So that's a good idea. She's asking me to read this question in itty bitty teeny type here. Oh, I'm wondering why seizures are the number two reason for an ER visit. And I'm wondering how much of this has to do with um, UTIs as they also lower the seizure threshold. Um, yeah, I think the the. There are a couple of reasons I believe that seizures, um, I mean, we can dig down in and I could probably pull up sort of, if we looked at every single instance, but such a big number. One of the reasons that seizures are high is that it's part of protocols for people. You know, if they have, you know, X number of seizures in 24 hours or whatever, they go to the ER to be seen. Um, another reason is that they actually have a fall during a seizure, you know, where people either was unwitnessed, so they don't know if they injured themselves, they're sort of found and they, you know, are having a seizure, so they don't know if they were injured. So again, it's that you know, let, let's, let's make sure that they're not hurt as a result of the seizure or if it lasts for a certain length of time. Um, generally, though, if when they go to the ER because they're having a seizure and it is found that they have a UTI or something, that is what would be listed as the reason for the ER. It's a, sort of the ultimate diagnosis that would be listed as the reason um, um, for it. So, you know, we would have selected UTI as the reason for seizure, you know, um, was sort of the presenting issue, and then it was determined that they had a UTI when they went to the went to the ER. So, um, or another reason, sometimes people have will you see them having seizures when they're septic. But I think there are a lot of reasons. Lots of times it's just because it's part of the protocol. You know, I think. Okay. Well, we're right at 11 a.m. I'd like to thank our speakers today, and for everyone who's on the line participating. And we mentioned this, but we will post an archive version of today's presentation and the materials on the website soon. And we'll share that information as soon as it's available. So thank you very much. Thank